of the longest chapter to the shortest. And so you will find in the book itself some of these more tolerant verses at a later point in the book than the very intolerant ones advocating violence and subjugation of infidels. But that doesn't mean they came into being later on. Quite the contrary, if there is ever a contradiction between two injunctions, the ones that came later on in Medina uh, are the ones that retain their validity and the early ones from Mecca have been abrogated. The peaceful verses became mensucha, means made null and void, with verses like the verses of the sword. Traditional Islamic theology has it that the ninth chapter of the Quran, Surah 9, is the last revealed in the career of the Prophet. And it is the only one that doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Some have said that that's because there's no compassion or mercy in this particular chapter, and that it is the Qur'an's last word on jihad, and in particular on how Muslims should behave toward unbelievers. In it is the celebrated verse of the sword. And what does the verse of the sword say? It's very clear. That when the forbidden months are over, kill the people of the book wherever you find them. Lay siege for them, lay wait for them. Lay ambush for them. Kill them wherever you find them. Uh, in fact, I converted to Christianity. Muhammad clearly stated that in the ends of days, there will be many who defect from the faith. Kill them when you see them, wherever you find them. So, this is the question that the West needs to understand. What part of kill don't they understand? You said that the president reiterated the message of tolerance and the importance that this is not a campaign against Islam or Arab nations generally. Has it been communicated to the administration from those nations from that part of the world that you've been talking to recently that is a highly critical thing for the president to do, not just once, but over and over and over again? So why? We are a country that judges people not by their religious beliefs or by their color but by the fact that we're all Americans. So that was the first part of the message. The second part of the message is that we have a lot of friends around the world who are Muslim. We have countries that are long friends of the United States who are of the Islamic faith. And the president wanted, be, wanted to be very clear that uh, this is not a war of, quote, civilizations, that this is not a war against Islam. This is a war against people who in many ways pervert what Islam stands for. Islam stands for uh, peace and stands for nonviolence, and he wanted to make that very, very clear. Yeah, sure. Islam and Islamic civilization are unique in their stance toward nonbelievers, and that Islam is the only religion in the world that has a developed doctrine, theology, and law that mandates violence against unbelievers. That there are peaceful Muslims, there are Muslims around the world who are moderate, who uh, live in harmony with their non-Muslim neighbors and have no intention of ever waging war against them in any way. But the fact is that they have a very slim justification for their own peacefulness within the Islamic sources themselves. And they are only at peace with their neighbors insofar as they are either ignorant of what Islam teaches about how Muslims should behave toward unbelievers, or they have explicitly rejected, consciously rejected, those elements of Islam. There are, in short, peaceful and moderate Muslims, but no peaceful and moderate Islam. The idea that Islam is a religion of peace, however, is paradoxically enough held even by the most violent and radical of Muslims. Sayyid Qutb, the Egyptian Muslim theorist, whose writings are revered by radical Muslims today, by terrorists today, he wrote and insisted that Islam is a religion of peace. When you study his writings, it becomes clear that he meant that Islam is dedicated to establishing the hegemony of Islamic law over the world. 
When that hegemony is established, peace will reign in the world. Therefore, Islam is a religion of peace. But the problem is the peaceful Muslims don't understand the edicts that comes out of the jurisprudence of Islam. If you look at the interpretation of these verses in Al-Azhar University, in the Islamic Sharia uh, schools in, in Jerusalem, in Jordan, in Syria, and Damascus, all throughout the Middle East, the jurisprudence of Islam clearly state emphatically that the verse of the sword made null and void all the peaceful verses. And what does the verse of the sword say? Then when the sacred months have passed, then kill the mushrikun, unbelievers, wherever you find them, and capture them and besiege them, and prepare for them each and every ambush. But if they repent and perform as-salat, the Islamic prayers, and give zakat, alms, then leave their way free. Verily, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Kill them when you see them, whatever you find them. This is not an allegoric kill. It's a literal kill. It's the killing of Zarqawi, right in front of the camera. It's the lynching that you see in Ramallah. It's the killing of over a million Sudanese in Sudan, cutting the hands and the feet from opposite sides. And here's the dilemma. The peaceful verse, even the peaceful verse that is quoted, even by Bush, the verse goes as follows. Whoever kills a life without just cause or for doing mischief in the land, then as, he's, as he killed the entire earth. You'll find the same verse in the Judeo-Biblical tradition. But most Westerners never skip after that verse, which makes very clear. But as those who do mischief in the land, then cut their hands and their feet from opposite sides and crucify them, literally. And that's what you see what happened in Afghanistan. That's what you see what happened in Sudan. Amount, a huge amount of crucifixions and killings and beheadings and amputations and public assassinations. They really want to revive Islam as it used to be. This is why they call it Islamic fundamentalism. The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified or their hands and their feet be cut off on the opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a great torment is theirs in the hereafter. The Prophet cut off the hands and feet of the men belonging to the tribe of Arina and did not cauterize their bleeding limbs till they died. There is no assurance of what is known in Christianity as salvation and insurance of being saved and guaranteeing going to heaven. However, there are certain things that can help. So if if a Muslim, for instance, died while he was practicing jihad, he is supposed to go to paradise. In the Islamist thinking, the assurance of your salvation is dying as a martyr. In accordance to the verse in the Quran, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتُلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Do not think that the ones who die in the cause of Allah in jihad are dead but are living. So this assures salvation. This is the calculus behind modern suicide bombing. Many people will say, modern Muslim advocates will say, that Islam forbids suicide. And this is plainly dishonest because all the advocates, all the defenders of suicide bombing in the Islamic world start out by saying this is not suicide. This is, the intention of the person is not to kill himself. The intention of the person is to kill others and that is sanctioned because it is Islamic Jihad. And if in the process they are killed themselves, that's an unavoidable consequence 